Hello and welcome to this Live Faith TV presentation from England. We're on Acts 2, 9, 13, or Acts 28, Dispensationalism. This is Session 7, a survey of Paul's early epistles. There's quite a few uh, early epistles, so we're starting this with Part 1. We're going to get through Romans 1 through 8. God bless you in Jesus' name. I'm Richard. We've been going through uh, the different views of dispensationalism in this series of videos, and we've covered, you know, the main views of, of uh, Acts 2, Acts 9, Acts 13, and Acts 28 dispensationalism, and now we have to go through Paul's early epistles to see what they say because they have a direct bearing on this subject on which dispensational view, if any, are correct. So we can't get through Romans, the whole thing. It's a big book, 16 chapters. We can't get through it in one session. So I'm just going to go through the first eight uh, chapters tonight. And I'd like to tell you that I have uh, discovered yesterday, found out that my Dear sister in Ohio has about three months to live because of cancer, and I would appreciate prayers for her, for her mental state, for her uh, to trust God, not have fear, and uh, for God to be with her. So I would appreciate that. So let's get into this. There is no slide presentation. As I have told you before in this series, I am writing a book as we do this. And I'll give you that book when we're done for free. You'll be able to download it from livefaith.tv. So let's get started on this and uh, this survey of Paul's epistles. We've surveyed the book of Acts and Paul's latter epistles to Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians for clues to administrative changes from the four accounts of our Lord. But before we can effectually evaluate Acts 28 position. We must also survey Paul's early epistles, which we will do in this section of this study. The timing of the writing of Paul's epistles is vital to our study. We can safely say with all confidence that 1st and 2nd Thessalonians were written first, followed by Galatians, then by 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and finally Romans. But the content of those epistles is just as critically important. Take note of this scripture in 2 Timothy 3.15, or 3.16, sorry. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for or which is instruction in righteousness. Paul's epistles follow that pattern, doctrine, reproof, and correction, as I'll show you right now written before Acts 28 to uh, 26 through 28, we have all these early epistles. Just keep that in mind. They're written before Acts 28. So Romans, we have doctrine. That is the foundational doctrine of justification through faith. Doctrine concerning the evangel of God which is also called my evangel. Paul called it my evangel three times. So Romans is doctrine concerning the evangel of God. First and second Corinthians reproves practical error about the evangel of God that crept into the church due to failure to adhere to the doctrine in Romans. Galatians contains correctional instruction to correct people back to the right doctrine in Romans. Then we have the next three. So that, those three form a group, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Galatians, doctrine, reproof, and correction. Then the latter epistles of Paul form uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians follow the same pattern. Ephesians is doctrine concerning the one body of Christ with Christ as head. Philippians contains reproof, and uh, Colossians contains correction about that one body of Christ, the doctrine in Ephesians, in other words. Then we have 1st and 2nd Thessalonians standing on their own. Although it was given first, it comes last in the order of Paul's epistles because it's the last thing that's going to happen to the church of, that uh, Paul is assembling here. 
or forming in his as he works and writes his epistles. First and second Thessalonians are also doctrine concerning the Lord's return. But there's no reproof and no correctional epistle because we can't screw that up. Man can't interfere or assist the Lord in any way concerning the return for his body. So no reproof or correction. So again, the early epistles, we have Romans as doctrine, First and Second Corinthians as reproof to that doctrine, and Galatians as correction. Those are the ones we want to go through. In this session, we're just going to go through the first eight chapters of Romans. I'm going to break uh, Romans down further for you later. But now we'll simply survey Paul's epistles for clues about any administrative changes that differ Paul's evangel from the evangel presented in the four accounts of our Lord, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So let's begin this survey. The Apostle Paul begins his epistle to the Romans by announcing the evangel of God. Let's read Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, a called apostle, severed for the evangel of God, which God promises before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, I want to make three points there. Number one, the apostle Paul was appointed by Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. And he was severed from the circumcision for the evangel of God. Would not those who came in into the overall kingdom of God under Paul's ministry also be severed then? Number two, the title Christ Jesus is predominantly unique to the Apostle Paul. Peter uses it only once in his two epistles to the circumcision, and none of the other circumcision writings use it at all. Christ Jesus refers to the risen, ascended, and glorified Christ, while Jesus refers to the suffering Savior. So this title, Christ Jesus, emphasizes the risen, ascended, and glorified one who suffered on the cross. And those sufferings done once and for all are past, never to be revealed. The third point I want to make, the evangel committed to Paul, and not the twelve apostles, is here called the evangel of God, which was promised before through the prophets of old. This is not new revelation, but neither is it the gospel of the kingdom, as you shall see. Let's continue in Romans 1, 3 through 6. This, God, this evangel of God concerns his son, who comes of the seed of David according to the flesh, who is designated son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have obtained grace and apostleship for faith obedience among all nations for his name's sake, among whom you are also the called of Jesus Christ. So this evangel of God concerns God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, but who was designated the very Son of God by his resurrection from the dead by the Spirit of holiness. We see Jesus linked to King David here, but just as we saw in Peter's speeches to the Jews in the first section, the first chapters, 12 chapters of the book of Acts, the designation as the seed of David is supplied as proof to the Jews that Jesus was crucified. The Jesus that was crucified is indeed the Messiah and the King promised to Israel through whom all the nations on the earth would be blessed. Point five, those to whom Paul writes are called to faith obedience, not to law obedience. Note that this gospel of God is not based on the law. The reference to King David then is given to prove to the Jews who are called by the evangel of God that Jesus, who is resurrected, is indeed the Messiah promised to Israel. We will learn, learn more about the origins of this previously given evangel of God as we continue. Romans 1, 13 and 14. Now I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that often I purposed to come to you and was prevented hitherto, that I should be having some fruit among you also, according as among the rest of the nations. 
to both Greeks and barbarians, to both wise and foolish, a debtor am I. Uh, point six, Paul states who he is sent to, all the nations. Romans were Gentiles, but as we shall see, he is also calling out a remnant of the Jews. We continue in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the, God, of the evangel, for it is God's power for salvation to everyone who is believing, to the Jew first and to the Greek as well. For in it, in this evangel of God, God's righteousness is being revealed out of faith for faith, according as it is written, now the just one by faith shall be living. And the just one refers to Jesus Christ. In this evangel of God, point seven, God's righteousness is being revealed to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The Greek, Greeks being the largest contingent of Gentiles at that time, refers to the Gentiles. But why Jew first? Paul answers that question a little later in this epistle, namely in chapter 2, which we will cover. Point 8. In this evangel of God, God's righteousness is being revealed out of faith and for faith. That shows us again that this evangel does not have the written law as its foundation or its object. Jews and Gentiles called through Paul's evangel are not being called to adhere to the Mosaic law. Romans 2, 2 through 13. Now we are aware that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who are committing such things. Before this verse, a bunch of uh, unrighteous acts are listed. And he's saying now we're aware that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who are committing such things. Verse 3, yet, you are, yet are you reckoning on this, O man, who are judging those committing such things and are doing the same, that you will be escaping the judgment of God? Or are you despising the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, being ignorant that the kindness of God is leading you to repentance? Yet in accord with your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are hoarding for yourselves indignation in the day of indignation and revelation of the just judgment of God, who will be paying each one in accord with his acts. To those indeed who by endurance in good acts are seeking glory and honor and incorruption, life Ionian, yet to those of faction and stubborn, indeed as to the truth, yet persuaded to injustice, indignation and fury, affliction and distress on every human soul which is effecting evil, both of the Jew first and of the Gentile, of the Greek meaning Gentile. Yet glory and honor and peace to every worker of good, both to the Jew first and to the Greek or the Gentile. For there is no partiality with God. For whoever sinned without law, without law also shall perish. And whoever sinned in law, through law will be judged. For not the listeners to law are just with God, but the doers of law shall be justified. Point nine, verse three refers to Jews who are being, uh, that's chapter two, verse three, are, refers to Jews who are judging the Gentiles as sinners and idolaters of the nations. Their calling as Jews did not save them from the judgment of God as they supposed it would. Point 10, verse nine, Ionian life or Ionian judgment upon all both to the Jew first and to the Greek. Again, we see although Jews have preference among Gentiles, that preference does not exclude them from God's judgment. The purpose of the first two chapters of Romans, after the introduction then, is to set the stage for God's solution to the problem of sin after he shows that the whole world, Jew and Gentile, will be judged by God's righteous standard. Therefore, God shows first that the whole world, Jew and Gentile, are condemned by their works, no matter how righteous those works appear to be. Point 11, verse 13, doers of the law shall be justified. This refers to works justification, not faith justification. This is obvious because we were already told that this evangel of God is out of faith, unto faith. Out of the faith of Jesus Christ, 
unto the believer's faith, apportioned to the believer by God. Romans 2, 14 through 16. For whenever they of the nations that have no law by nature may be doing that which the law demands, these having no law are a law to themselves, who are displaying the action of the law written on their hearts, their conscience testifying together, and their reckonings between one another, accusing or defending them. In the day when God will be judging the hidden things of humanity, according to my evangel, through Jesus Christ. Point 12. It said in verse 14, the nations were never put under the, the Mosaic law, but their actions and their conscience, their realization of guilt, in other words, testify together that the law of God is written on their hearts. No one is without law. But the law of Moses was only given to Israel. Gentiles are not now being put under that law. Point 13, God will judge everyone by Paul's evangel, the evangel of God. Here called Paul's evangel for the first of three times in the Pauline epistles. Paul called the evangel of God my gospel. No one will be judged by the Mosaic law. We will find that this evangel of God, which is Paul's evangel, not Peter's, is to believe that Jesus died for our sins, was entombed, and was risen from the dead. In Romans 2, 17 through 29. Lo, you are being denominated a Jew and are resting on the law and are boasting in God and know the will and are testing what things are of consequence, being instructed out of the law. Besides, you have confidence in yourself to be a guide of the blind, a light to those in darkness, a discipliner of the imprudent, a teacher of minors, having the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. You then who are teaching another, you are not teaching yourself, who are heralding not to be stealing, you are stealing. Who, who are saying not to be committing adultery, you're committing adultery. Who are abominating idols, and you despoil the sanctuary. Who are boasting in a law, though the transgression of the law, you are through the, though through the translation of the law, you are dishonoring God. For because of you, the name of God is being blasphemed among the nations, according as it is written. For circumcision indeed is benefiting if you should be putting law into practice, yet if you should be a transgressor of law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. If the uncircumcision then, talking about Gentiles, should be maintaining the just requirements of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be reckoned for circumcision? And the uncircumcision, who by nature are discharging the law's demands, shall be judging you, <laughs> who through letter and circumcision are a transgressor of law. For not that which is a point, apparent is the Jew, not that which is apparent is the Jew, nor yet that which is apparent in flesh is circumcision, but that which is hidden in the Jew. The circumcision is of the heart, in spirit, not in letter, whose applause is not of men, but of God. So point 14 in verse 17, it said, Lo, you are being denominated a Jew and are resting on law and are boasting in God. This shows us that this epistle is also addressing Jews. But, it is, it, but is it all Jews or specifically those who are being called into Paul's evangel? Note that Paul does not dismiss the law here in any way. Point 15, the rest of this section, quoted above, explains the Gentiles who will act according to the law written in their hearts, who will be judging by their actions the Jew who does not keep the Mosaic law. Here we see there is still a difference between Jew and Gentile, but that the law of God written in the Gentiles' hearts is just as relevant as the Mosaic law is to the Jews. The law has not yet been set aside in this dissertation. That's point 15. In Romans 3, 1 and 2, what then is the prerogative of the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Much in every manner, for first indeed, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Point 16, 
Here the Jew is shown his preference over the Gentile. The prerogative or advantage of the Jew is that they were entrusted with the sayings, that's what me, oracles means, with the sayings of God, while Gentiles were not. Gentiles had to come through Israel to receive God's spiritual blessings, through Israel. Point 16. I'm sorry, that was point 16. Romans 3, 9 through 11. What then? Are we privileged? Undoubtedly not, for we previously charged both Jews and Greeks to be all under sin. <laughs> According as it is written that not one is just, not even one. No one is understanding. No one is seeking out God. Point 17. The Jew has no privilege over the Gentile when it comes to God's judgment. Paul includes himself here as a Jew. All are under sin. No one is just, not even one. No one understands. No one is seeking out God. Both Jew and Gentile are condemned. Later in chapter 5 of Romans, we'll find out that this condemnation of all mankind occurred in Adam and has nothing to do with men's individual sins. Those sins are all the result of being condemned in Adam. Romans 3, 18 through 20. There's no fear of God in front of their eyes. Now, this gets down to the real cause of all this uh, negativity, that all this sinning. Uh, all are condemned in Adam. Verse 19, now we are aware that whatever the law is saying, it is speaking to those under the law that every mouth may be barred and the entire world may become subject to the just verdict of God. Because by works of law, no flesh at all shall be justified in his sight. For through law is the recognition of sin. Point 18. All mankind is irreverent, whether Jew or Gentile, and all mankind comes under condemnation because of it. Here the entire world is shown to be condemned by their actions, demonstrating their need for a Savior. Demonstrating their need for a Savior. Through law, no flesh will be justified. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Yet now, apart from law, a righteousness of God is manifest, being attested by the law and prophets, yet a righteousness of God through Jesus Christ's faith for all and on all who are believing, for there is no distinction, for all sinned and are wanting of the glory of God, being justified freely, gratuitous, gratuitous, gratuitously, in his grace, through the deliverance which is in Christ Jesus, whom God pur uh, purposed for a propitiatory shelter through faith in his blood for a display of his righteousness because of the passing over the penalties of sins which occurred before in the forbearance of God, toward the display of his righteousness in the current era for him to be just and a justifier of the one who has the faith of Jesus. Point 19, we read that yet now apart from law, a righteousness of God is manifest, being attested by the law and the prophets. So God is revealing his righteousness through Jesus Christ's faith. God's righteousness without the law is being attested to by the law and the prophets because the law condemns and demonstrates man's need for a savior. Man, whether Jew or Gentile, cannot save himself by his works, whether good or bad, because man's best, apart from God, is just filthy rags. Point 20. God's righteousness, not man's, is for all, without exception, but is now already upon all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile, because there is no distinction or discrimination between them in God's eyes, since all men are sinners and all are wanting, and that word wanting means in dire need of the glory of God. Point 21. God provided the sacrifice of his son for a propitiatory shelter, a mercy seat, through faith in Jesus' blood. God overlooks sins that occurred before Jesus' sacrifice in view of his sacrifice in the future, and from the sacrifice on because of his sacrifice. Point 22. God thus proves he is just, and he is the justifier of him who has the faith of Jesus Christ. The onus is on God 
through Christ and his sacrifice, not on man and his works or on his own believing. God is justifying men gratuitously in his grace through the deliverance which is in Christ Jesus toward the display of his righteousness in the current era. Romans 3, 27 through 31. Where then is the boasting? It is debarred through what law? Of works? No, through faith's law. For we are reckoning a man to be justified by faith apart from works of law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not of the nations also? Yes, of the nations also. If so be that God is one who will be justifying the circumcision out of faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Are we then nullifying law through faith? May it not be coming to that. Nay, we are sustaining law. Point 23. Boasting by man is made impossible because it is Jesus Christ's faith that saves him. Man is justified by Jesus Christ's faith apart from the works of the law. Point 24. God is not only God of the Jews, but of the Gentiles, the nations also. Point 25, the circumcision will be justified through the faith of Jesus Christ apart from law. I'm sorry, 25, the circumcision will be justified out of faith of Jesus Christ when they realize law cannot save them, while Gentiles will be justified through the faith of Jesus Christ apart from law. I'll repeat that. The circumcision will be justified out of the faith of Jesus Christ when they realize law cannot save them, while Gentiles will be justified through the faith of Jesus Christ apart from law. 26. The law has not been nullified, but rather has been sustained. Only Jesus Christ could fulfill the law, and man can only be justified, which means to be made righteous, through Jesus Christ's faith. This is how the law and the prophets attested to the manifestation of God's righteousness. Romans 4, 1 through 5. What then shall we declare that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For an Abraham, if Abraham was justified by his acts, he has something to boast in, but not toward God. He could just boast in himself. For what is the scripture saying? Now Abraham believes God, and it is reckoned in him for righteousness. Now to the worker, the wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as a debt. Yet to him who is not working, yet who is believing on him, who is justifying the irreverent, his faith is reckoned for righteousness. Point 27. Abraham, quote, our forefather, unquote, was justified by believing God not by believing in God. The, the word our, O-U-R, our includes both Jews and Gentiles. For in Abraham, not only Jews would be blessed, but also Gentiles, because all the families of the earth are to be blessed through Abraham. All the families of the earth necessarily include all Gentiles, even those who are of the joint body of Christ in Acts 28, 26 through 28. Point 28, the previous boasting is debarred statement is explained here. Abraham was not justified by acts, but by believing God. Point 29, Abraham's righteousness was reckoned unto him. It was God's righteousness that was imputed to him, not his own. Point 30, yet to him who is not working, yet is believing on him who is justifying the irreverent, his faith is reckoned for righteousness. God is justifying the irreverent. It was God's righteousness imputed to him, not his own, remember. The irreverent who believed God are justified through Jesus Christ's faith. God's righteousness is imputed unto them. In Romans 4, 6 through 8, even as David is telling of the happiness of the man to whom God is reckoning righteous apart from acts, happy... They whose lawlessnesses were pardoned and whose sins were covered over. Happy the man to whom the Lord by no means should be reckoning sin. When a man is justified by God, the Lord will never reckon his sin. Justification is for life, and it's not probationary. That's point 31. Romans 4, 10 through 18. How then is it reckoned? 
How's God's righteousness reckoned? Being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. That's Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. And he obtained the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which was in uncircumcision, for him to be the father of all who are believing, through uncircumcision, for righteousness to be reckoned to them. And the father of circumcision, not to those of the circumcision only, but to those also who are observing the elements of the faith in the footprints of our father Abraham in uncircumcision. For not through law is the promise to Abraham or to his seed for him to be an enjoyer of the allotment of the world, but through faith's righteousness. For if those of the law are enjoyers of the allotment, faith has been made void and the promise has been nullified. For the law is producing indignation or wrath. Now where no law is, neither is there transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it may accord with grace for the promise to be confirmed to the entire seed, not to those of the law only, but to those also of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. According as it is written, that a father of many nations have I appointed you, facing which he believes it of God, who is vivifying the dead and calling what is not as if it were who being beyond expectation, believes in expectation, for him to become the father of many nations, according to that which has been declared, thus shall your seed be. And not being infirm in faith, he considers, Abraham considers his own body already deadened, being inherently somewhat about a hundred years, and the deadening of the matrix of Sarah, yet the promise of God was not doubted in unbelief, but he was invigorated by faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what he had promised, he is able to do also. Wherefore also it is reckoned to him for righteousness. We're given the example of Abraham here. Point 32, God's righteousness is being reckoned in uncircumcision, not circumcision. Circumcision is a work and is not of faith. Point 33, circumcision was merely a fleshy rite given as a seal of God's righteousness through faith. Point 34, Abraham is the father of all who are believing through uncircumcision. He is the father of the circumcision also. Point 35, the unconditional promise that all the world would be justified was given to Abraham before circumcision and before the Mosaic law was given. Point 36, to those who rely on law-keeping for justification, faith is made void and God's promise is nullified. The law only produces God's wrath, indignation. Point 37, where there is no law, there is no transgression, but sin still exists. In Romans 5, we learn that all who lived from Adam to Moses died, including Gentiles who have no law, but their death was not because of transgressing the law, but because of Adam's transgression. Point 38, faith accords with grace, while law accords with works. God's righteousness is imputed to man by his grace, not by man's works. Point 39, Abraham's example is documented. He believed in expectation, hope, which was God's promise to him that he would bear a son through his loins even though he was beyond hope to father a child himself at about 100 years of age. He was fully assured that God would perform what he had promised, and God's righteousness was imputed to him because he believed God. Romans 4, 23 through 25. Now it was not written because of him only that it is reckoned to him, but because of us also to whom it is about to be reckoned who are believing on him who rouses Jesus, our Lord, from among the dead, who was given up because of our offenses and was roused because of our justifying. Point 40. The promise of God's righteousness through faith extends to all who believe on God, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from among the dead. Point 41. Jesus was given up as a sacrifice because of our offenses and was roused because of our justifying. Point 42, 
Abraham is given as a forerunner of faith. All who believe, Jew and Gentile, are justified by believing in Jesus Christ's faith. This is true for the current era. After this era, men will believe by sight when they see our Lord Jesus Christ at the various stages of his return. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Being then justified by faith, we may be having peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access also by faith into this grace in which we stand and may be glorying in the expectation of the glory of God. We're awaiting glorification. Point 43. The believer, whether Jew or Gentile, is already justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and has peace with God. Having peace, the believer now has free, unhindered access to God by God's grace through the faith of Jesus Christ and is glorying in the expectation of the glory of God. The unbeliever can only expect God's wrath. Point 44. God's righteousness will be imputed to all mankind eventually through Jesus Christ's faith. But the context of Romans 3 and 4 and the first two verses of chapter 5 concern only those who believe now in the current era. The rest of Romans 5 will change the context to all mankind as God gives a wider vision of what Christ accomplished on the cross. So we'll continue with Romans 5, 6 through 11. For Christ, while we are still infirm, still in accord with the era, for the sake of the irreverent, died. For hardly for the sake of a just man will anybody be dying. For, uh, for the sake of a good man, perhaps someone may even be daring to die. Yet God is commending his love to us, seeing that while we were still sinners, Christ died for our sakes. Much rather than being now justified in his blood, we shall be saved from indignation through him. For if being enemies we are conciliated to God through the death of his Son, much rather being conciliated, we shall be saved in his life. Yet not only so, but we are glorying also in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now obtained the conciliation. Point 45. Christ died for us. In this context, both Jew and Gentile believers, while we were still infirm sinners. Point 46, now justified in his blood through the, his death on the cross, we shall be saved from wrath, from indignation through Christ. But Israel is to expect God's wrath to the uttermost. Verse, four, uh, I mean, point 47. We were conciliated to God through the death of his son. Having been conciliated, we shall be saved in his life. We, in the context, is both Jew and Gentile believers. We have obtained the conciliation. The conciliation is announced here. God conciliated the world unto himself. It says that in 2 Corinthians 5.19, also written right at the same time Romans was, same period. The conciliation is announced right here and in Romans 5, uh, 2, 2 Corinthians 5.19. And those who believe have obtained the conciliation. Reconciliation is the result. The conciliation was new revelation, never before revealed in the Law and the Prophets, never revealed by Christ during his earthly ministry or in the book of Acts. Now, new doctrine usually introduces a new administration of God's rule of man. However, this secret is part of the evangel of God. It's the secret of the evangel. It was revealed before in part, which Paul is making fully known in Romans and in 2 Corinthians 5. Instead of constituting a new administration, this secret is part of the evangel of God, and it reveals that God conciliated himself to the world through Christ's death on the cross. The cross event was the trigger for this more complete revelation of the conciliation. The event on the cross occurred many years before the announcement of, and full application of the conciliation. So the conciliation corresponds to about Acts 19.10. 
And what that means is God uh, removed all obstacles to be approached by man. And Gentiles no longer had to go through Israel, but they could come directly to God through Jesus Christ. So point 49, the evangel of God, which God promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, goes back to Abraham before the law and before the covenant of circumcision. It reveals justification through faith, not works. But even more than justification, God has made us family. He reconciled us to himself through the cross of Christ. That goes beyond justification. Point 50. This group or class of Jewish and Gentile believers who come into the overall kingdom of God through Paul's evangel constitute a body of believers that are separate and distinct from the nation of Israel. Gentile believers under Paul's ministry then cannot be termed proselytes of Israel. They're a separate body. Paul never uses the word proselyte to describe the Gentile believer's relationship with God in any of his epistles, early or latter. The new creation in Christ, which is revealed in the early epistles, has nothing to do with ethnic Israel. Point 51. Israel will not be reconciled to God until the new heaven and earth are created. Those who believe under Paul's evangel are already reconciled and are the first members of the new creation in Christ. In this new creation, Jews and Gentiles are one spiritually, but not politically, because we're still in this world. But in the new humanity, there is no preference whatever for the Jews. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, even as through one man, this now the context change, changes here to the whole world, all mankind, watch and see. Romans 5, 12 through 21. Therefore, even as through one man sin entered into the world, and through sin death, and thus death passed through, uh, through into all mankind, on which all sinned, for until sin was, until law, sin was in the world. Yet sin is not being taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigns from Adam to Moses, over those who did not sin in the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is about to be. Verse 15, but not as the offense, thus also the grace. For if by the offense of the one, the many died, much rather the grace of God and the gratuity in grace, which is of the one man, Jesus Christ, to the many superabounds. And not as through one act of sinning is the gratuity, for indeed the judgment is out of one into condemnation, yet the grace is out of many offenses into a just award. Verse 17, for if by the offense of the one, death reigns through the one, much rather those obtaining the superabundance of grace and the gratuity of righteousness shall be reigning in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Consequently then, verse 18, as it was through one offense for all mankind for condemnation, thus also it is through one just award for all mankind for life's justifying. For even as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were constituted sinners, thus also through the obedience of the one, that same many shall be constituted just." Yet law came in by the way that the offense should be increasing. Yet where sin increases, grace super exceeds. That even as sin reigns in death, thus grace also should be reigning through righteousness for life eonian through Jesus Christ our Lord. That was a long section, but powerful. For point 52, this section of Romans reveals the universality of the effects of the cross of Christ. Two men are in view one through whom condemnation and death pass to the entire creation, the other through whom all mankind will be justified. Chapters 1 through 5, 9 of Romans concentrated on justification promised through Abraham. Chapters 5 through 8 focus on the conciliation not promised before. It's the secret of the evangel of God. Romans six fourteen. For sin shall not be lording it over you, for you are not under law, 
but under grace. Point 53, written to Jews and Gentiles under Paul's evangel, believers are not under law, but are under God's grace. Romans 7, 1, or are you ignorant, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is lording it over a man for as much time as he is living? Point 54, Israel is under law, but Gentiles are not. But Paul isn't speaking to ethnic Israel here in the seventh chapter of Romans, but to Jews and Gentiles who form a new body of believers who are under God's grace. This is why Paul says that he is speaking to those who know law, not to those under law. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. Verses 2 through 6. For a woman in wedlock is bound to, to a living man by law. Yet if the man should be dying, she is exempt from the law of the man. Consequently then, while the man is living, she will be styled an adulteress if she should be becoming another man's. Yet if the man should be dying, she is free from the law, being no adulteress on becoming another man's. So that my brethren, you also were put to death to the law through the body of Christ, for you to become another's, who is roused from among the dead, that we should be bearing fruit to God. Verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the passion of sins, which were through the law, operated in our members to be bearing fruit to death. Yet now we were exempted from law, dying in that in which we were retained, so that it is for us to be slaving in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Point 55. Uh, we read, you also, as in the example given of the woman, were put to death to the law through the body of Christ. The law was withdrawn for those Jews in the newly forming body of believers under Paul's evangel. There we have it. Verse 56. Verse 56. Yet now we were exempted from law, dying in that which we were retained, so that it is for us to be slaving in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Those under Paul's evangel are exempted from the law. Romans 7.24, a wretched man am I, Paul says, in the context of being under law. Who will rescue me out of this body of death? grace. Point 57. Jews under the law were under the condemnation of the law, but now that God's righteousness is being revealed by God's grace instead of law, they are being rescued from that condemnation. This is only true of believing Jews called out by Paul's evangel. Jews outside of the calling of Paul's evangel are still under that condemnation. Romans 8, 1 through 4. Nothing, consequently, is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Not according to flesh are they walking, but according to spirit. For the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus frees you from the law of sin and death. For what was impossible to the law, in which it was infirm through the flesh, did God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sin's flesh and concerning sin, he condemns sin in the flesh that the just requirement of the law may be fulfilled in us who are not walking in accord with flesh, but in accord with spirit. So it said nothing consequently, eight, Romans 8, 1 and 2, nothing consequently is now condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, not according to the flesh are they walking, but according to spirit, for the spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus frees you from the law of sin and death. Point 58, those in Christ Jesus are not under any condemnation at all, regardless of their walks. The phrase, not according to flesh are they walking, but according to spirit, is only in one of the three most ancient manuscripts and does not fit the context, because the believer's position in Christ has nothing to do with their walk, but with Christ Jesus himself. The next verse explains why there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Because the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made them free from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? The ration of sin is death. That's the law of sin and death. But the gift of God is the only in life. So a gift is given without regard to the works which are associated with a person's walk. 
The gift is only given to those under Paul's evangel, not to ethnic Israel or Gentiles who do not believe according to Paul's evangel. Romans 8, 9, and 10. Yet you are not in flesh, but in spirit, if so be that God's spirit is making his home in you. Now, if anyone has not Christ's spirit, this one is not his. <laughs> now, if Christ be in you, verse 10, the body indeed is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is life because of righteousness. Point 59. God's spirit makes it home, its home in those who, are, who believe according to Paul's evangel, not the evangel of the kingdom, which is two and four, only those of the circumcision. Christ is never said to be in those who believe according to the kingdom of angel, the evangel of the circumcision. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For whoever are being led of God's spirit, these are the sons of God. For you did not get slavery spirit, again to fear, but you got the spirit of sonship, in which we are crying, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself is testifying together with our spirit that we are the children of God. Yet if children, enjoyers also of an allotment, enjoyers indeed of an allotment from God, yet joint enjoyers of Christ's allotment, if so be that we are suffering together, that we should be glorified together also. Point 60. Those of Israel are not called sons of God. They're called servants. In Galatians 4, 7, we are specifically told that those in the new creation are the sons of God, no longer being called God's servants. Gentiles who believe under Paul's evangel cannot be proselytes of Israel then. Proselytes are not even called the servants of God. They're the servants and handmaids of Israel. Point 61. The allotment those under Paul's evangel receive is not qualified here. It does not say the allotment of the world, which it said earlier in regard to Abraham and Israel. Uh, so the allotment of those under Paul's evangel is not qualified here. Christ Jesus inherits all of God's kingdom. It says that this body that is being formed under Paul's evangel receives, uh, are in joint enjoyers of Christ's allotment. Joint enjoyers of Christ's allotment. Here in Romans chapter 8, okay? The full details of the new creation, those under Paul's evangels, their inheritance is not specified here only that they will receive an inheritance under Christ that is a provision of Christ's own inheritance. The celestial allotment has not yet been revealed here, as it is in Ephesians. All that had been revealed had to do with Christ's terrestrial inheritance. That being the case, the Gentile believers may have assumed their inheritance was in the terrestrial realm, but the text here does not specify that. It just says they have an allotment that is Christ's allotment, part of Christ's allotment. Romans 8, 18, and 19. For I am reckoning that the sufferings of the current era do not deserve the glory about to be revealed for us, for the premonition of the creation is awaiting the unveiling of the sons of God. Point 62. Again, believers under Paul's evangel are called the sons of God. Proselytes could never be called the sons of God when those of ethnic Israel were not. Romans 8, 20 through 23. For to vanity was the creation subjected, not voluntarily, but because of him who subjects it in expectation, that the creation also shall be freed from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we are aware that the entire creation is groaning and travailing together until now. Yet not only so, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, we ourselves also are groaning in ourselves, awaiting the sonship, the deliverance of our body. So awaiting this point 63, awaiting the sonship, does not mean believers under Paul's evangel are not already considered the sons of God. This is the now but not yet uh, paradigm that we find all through Paul's epistles. It's the now but not yet. 
It's the reality of what Christ accomplished for us. We have been made righteous, but we're not yet righteous. We have been saved, or being saved, and yet shall be saved. We already have an inheritance, but we will not, it will not be fully realized until our change comes at the return of Christ. In the same way, we are sons, but not fully until these bodies of corruption are replaced with our celestial bodies. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Now we are aware that God is working all together for the good of those who are loving God, who are thee called according to the purpose that whom he foreknew, he designates beforehand also to be conformed to the image of his son, for him to be the firstborn among many brethren. Now whom he designates beforehand, he also calls. Whom he calls, these he justifies also. Now whom he justifies, these he glorifies also. Point 64. Uh, the text said, whom he foreknew, he designates beforehand. Whom he designates beforehand, these he calls also. And whom he calls, these he justifies also. Now whom he justifies, these he glorifies also. Israel was called as a nation, and national repentance is required for their salvation, which is deliverance from their enemies and entrance into their terrestrial kingdom. Those under Paul's evangel are called individually. God is not talking about ethnic Israel here, but those individuals whom he foreknew and designated beforehand, before they were even born. Israel is not yet justified, but those who believe under Paul's evangel are. Both ethnic Israel and those that make up the new creation in Christ shall be glorified, but those of the new creation will be glorified first. Those under Paul's evangel are Christ's brethren, but Christ only called those of Israel who believed his friends. That's John 15. Uh, I, I, call you, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Friends are not family. If Gentile believers were proselytes at the time of this writing by Paul, they could not be called family. Romans 8, 33 through 39. Who will be indicting God's chosen ones? God, the justifier? Who will be the condemner? Christ Jesus, the one dying, yet rather being roused, who is also at God's right hand, who is pleading also for our sake? What shall be separating us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Affliction, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, according as it is written, that on thy account we are being put to death the whole day. We are reckoned as sheep for the slaughter. No, nay, in all these things we are more than conquering through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor messengers, nor sovereignties, nor present nor what is impending, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Point 65. Israel is still under law. The law has not yet been abrogated. The law condemns. But who can, play, who can lay any charge against those of Paul's evangel? God himself would not because he justified them. And who shall condemn those under Paul's evangel? Christ Jesus will not, for he intercedes for us. He pleads for us. Nothing whatsoever can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Those of the circumcision who believe must endure, stay faithful to the end to be saved. But those who believe under Paul's evangel are saved unconditionally by God's grace through the faith of Jesus Christ. These believers are super conquerors through Christ who loves us. Romans, all right, so that gets us through Romans chapter 8. I've made specific points, and we will follow up on this when we uh, analyze the pure Acts 28 position a little later in this series. In the next session, we'll go through Acts 9 through 11. We'll probably finish the whole book of Acts. Uh, it won't take it's long to go through Corinthians and Galatians. We're just looking for specific things about doctrinal changes, and there's a lot in Romans. That's why I had to go through that. So I want to thank you for being with me. That's it for today. I can't chat live because it's 
right now, 2 p.m. in the UK. And uh, so we got a few more hours before this will air in the U.S. We're six hours ahead of you over there. So thank you for joining me. I will be live on Saturday, I believe, and I'll see you then. God bless you in Jesus' name.